Winston Bright lived in New York, had a wife, Leslie, and three children. He worked for Verizon for 20 years. On October 12, 1990, Winston called his wife from work around lunchtime. All seemed to be fine with Winston, but he never arrived home. Leslie searched for her husband for years until she eventually gave up hope that he was still alive. Then, two decades later, a man arrived at Leslie's door by the name of Kwame Seku, who claimed he was Winston Bright. Leslie did not believe him, however. Kwame then went to court to have himself recognized as Winston Bright, but the case was thrown out since he had no way to prove it. It was only in 2018 when Kwame could prove that he was indeed Winston when he gave DNA samples that matched his mother's and children's DNA. Kwame claims that he was stricken with amnesia and the first thing he remembers is wandering the streets of San Diego with no idea who he was. He says he adopted his current name of Kwame Seku when he read it in a newspaper. He would only remember fragments of his previous life. In 2008, he started working as a teacher and worked until his retirement. He found out about his missing persons case online and realized that he was the man in question. He was on a trip to New York when he recognized a former acquaintance from a Jehovah's Witness group he belonged to. That acquaintance then notified his former wife. Leslie Bright said that she now believes Kwame is, in fact, Winston Bright but said she didn't believe his amnesia claim. She feels that Winston just abandoned them and started a new life. Edgar Latulip had a tough life. He was 21 years old, but he had a mind of a 12-year-old. This caused him to be extremely depressed, and he attempted to take his own life. In September of 1986, he found himself in the hospital, recovering from an attempt on his own life. When he was released from hospital, he did not go to the group home he lived in, in Kitchener, Ontario. He left his medication and everything he owned behind. Edgar simply did not possess the skills needed to survive on his own, especially not without his medicine. When his mother found out he disappeared, she immediately contacted the police. The police discovered that Edgar had traveled to Niagara Falls using a bus. This immediately worried them that he was about to attempt to end his life again. No one at Niagara Falls saw Edgar, however, and he wasn't found. Posters were put up, but of no leads, the case went cold. In 1993, the police were contacted by a man who claimed he had seen Edgar. Unfortunately, the man in question was never found. In January of 2016, a man came forward claiming he was Edgar Latulip. The man lived in St. Catharines, Ontario, and was in his 50s. He also had the same developmental delays that Edgar had. His DNA was quickly tested, and it turned out that he was in fact Edgar. He had an accident and got amnesia. After that, he moved to a new town and started a new life. Eventually, he started having flashbacks of a previous life that he could not remember. The name Edgar Latulip sounded familiar to him. Together with his social worker, they looked through the internet and found his missing persons poster. The police believes that Edgar traveled to Niagara Falls, hit his head and the injury gave him amnesia. The police does not want to disclose what life he has been leading in the last 30 years or what his assumed name was. I can confirm that he and his mother has reconciled and is making up for lost time. Timothy Carney disappeared on his way to church in 2004. He called his boss to say he would be late for a shift, but never showed up. His car was later found dumped by the roadside. Unfortunately, it contained no clues as to his whereabouts. His mother Phyllis and his father Ed 
devoted their lives to finding their missing son. They worked closely together with the Christian Foundation. The Christian Foundation was a national organization that helps to locate and bring home missing adults. It would take seven years after Timothy's disappearance before there was a breakthrough in the case. It turned out that Timothy was safe. He simply did not want to be found. Timothy had joined the Gospel Outreach. The Christian group is led by Pastor Jim Lefbridge and has previously been accused of poaching members from their families. His parents are still dedicated to getting in contact with their son, even if he abandoned them. Lula Gillespie Miller had four young children. One day in 1974, Lula suddenly disappeared. All of the children went to live with Lula's mother, Emma Gillespie. Emma would put on her porch light every night, hoping her daughter would return. Emma was a great grandmother, but the children missed their mother greatly, especially Tammy Miller. In 2010, Tammy searched for her mother online. She saw shocking articles about what could have possibly happened to her. She found a postcard that her mother had sent from Richmond, Virginia. Tammy also found out that Lula had transferred custody of the children to her mother. This meant that Lula most likely disappeared on her own accord. Tammy reached out to the Doe Network. They followed a paper trail and finally found Lula. She was living in Texas and was now 69 years old. Lula did not want to be found. She had a right to stay anonymous, but the police gave her Tammy's number for in case Lula wanted to call her. Lula did eventually call Tammy to tell her that she left them because she was too young to be a mother. Lula also told her that she would call her back when she had more time, which she never did. Tammy has stated that she will stop looking for her mother and that she will be moving on with her life. Emma passed away at the age of 91, two years before she would find out why her daughter was missing for 42 years. Mandy Stavik was born in Alaska. She had three siblings, Lee, Molly and Brent. In 1975, Mandy's older brother Brent was shot and killed in Anchorage, Alaska. His murder is still unsolved to this day. Mandy's mother Mary divorced her husband and moved away with the three children when Mandy was still a very young girl. They moved to a little town called Acme in Washington. Acme is described as a place where the residents don't lock doors and leave the keys in the ignition. There Mandy would graduate from Mount Baker High School. 1989 was her first year at Central Washington University. After her first semester finished, she came home for Thanksgiving break. The day after Thanksgiving she went for a jog. Normally Mandy would jog while her mother Mary would be riding her bicycle next to her. Mary's sister was visiting however, so Mandy went to jog with the family's German shepherd named Kira. While Mandy was running, her brother Lee saw her through a window on her way back home. He was visiting a friend named Jeremy. Mandy did not return home however. Two hours after she left, the dog showed up at the house with no sign of Mandy. Mary was now worried and called Mandy's boyfriend, Rick Zender. Rick told Mary that he had no idea where Mandy was unfortunately. Mary called the sheriff and everyone else she could think of. Soon lots of residents began searching for Mandy. She had been wearing a light colored sweatshirt, green sweatpants, light blue running shoes with a purple stripe and was listening to a Walkman when she vanished. The initial suspect was Rick Zender. He had been dating Mandy for three and a half years at that time. The relationship was described as on again off again. The police found him to be very eager to help and decided to let him go since they had no evidence that he was involved. Two days after Manny disappeared, green sweatpants was found by a search and rescue team. Mary told them she didn't believe it belonged to Mandy, 
but they sent it in for testing anyways. The sweatpants were never positively connected to Mandy. The next day, Mandy Stavik's body was found nearly six miles from her house in the Nooksack River. She was only wearing her shoes and socks. The autopsy that was done revealed that the cause of death was asphyxia by drowning. The pool of water she was in was very shallow, so it was strange to investigators that a strong swimmer such as Mandy would have drowned. There was also an injury on her head that a medical examiner said could have knocked her out. The police took DNA from Mandy's body. They were able to obtain a DNA profile from both Mandy and an unknown man. There was no one in their database had matched the DNA unfortunately. The police followed up on over 7,000 leads throughout the next few years, but it always ended up in a dead end. In 2009, Detective Kevin Bohe came up with the idea to test the DNA of every male that lived in Acme in 1989. Since it was such a small town, it could actually be done. They started making a list of everyone that lived in Acme in 1989. For the next four years, they analyzed several DNA samples from residents which did not provide a match. In 2013, they started to look at Timothy Bass. He lived on the same road as Mandy Stavik. Timothy also attended the same school as she did, and his younger brother Tom was friends with Mandy. Another key point was that Mandy would be running past his house every day when she was not at university. When investigators went to his house to ask if he would give him a voluntary DNA sample, he refused. When asked if he heard about the Mandy Stavik case, he said he did not. This seemed very odd for investigators since Mandy's case was very well known in their small community. In January 1990, Timothy Bass married Gina Malone and moved to Everson, about 19 miles north of Acme. They then had three children and Timothy became a delivery driver at a France bakery outlet. Timothy's wife Gina was also questioned. She said that her husband was very controlling. When they watched true crime shows, Timothy would always say how stupid people was for getting caught, and how he never would if he did something. All of this seemed strange enough to the investigators, so they decided to go to his workplace. There they asked Kim Wagner, who was Timothy's manager, to tell them where he works every day so they could follow him. She didn't feel like it was her place and told them that she won't be giving them any information. The investigators nevertheless tried their best to follow him, but Timothy didn't smoke, so they couldn't get a cigarette to get his DNA. A couple years later, Kim Wagner was at a bar with her husband and a few friends. The friends started to talk about the Mandy Savvy case and how her employee, Timothy, lived on the same street where Mandy lived. It was only then that Kim realized why the investigators wanted information about Timothy. She was now determined to help them. In 2017, she gave him a few items Timothy was using, including a water cup he had been drinking from. When investigators sent the cup for testing, they learned that a DNA retrieved from it matched the one taken from Mandy Stavik's body. At first, Timothy told police again that he had no idea about a Mandy Stavik case and haven't even heard about her. When Timothy learned about the DNA evidence, however, he changed his story. He told them that he and Mandy would often hook up when she was in town and that is why his DNA was found on her body. Timothy Bass was arrested on December 12, 2017 and charged with murder in the first degree. Mary Stavik learned of the arrest on her 81st birthday. During his trial, all the witnesses said that they never saw Timothy and Mandy together and that they didn't believe his story. Timothy's younger brother Tom and his mother both came forward claiming that Timothy wanted them to lie and cover for him. His wife Gina also said that the alibi she gave for Timothy that day was false and she was forced to give the alibi. On May 24, 2019, the jury convicted Timothy Bass of murder in the first degree. He was sentenced to 320 months in prison. Timothy then said, I would first like to say that I'm 100% innocent of his crime. I wish no ill will towards anyone here, not even today, but I'm having a hard time with this.
On November 25, 1987, a homeless man found a girl's body along Interstate 10 in Marana, Arizona. He walked to the local police station to report what he found. The police found tire tracks at the scene. This indicated that a girl was killed elsewhere and then moved to where the man found her. A medical examiner in Palma County did an autopsy and found she has been dead for at least two weeks. Her estimated age was between 17 and 21, about 5 foot 6 inches tall, and thought to be European American. She was shot five times with a 22 caliber firearm. In 2010, a forensic facial reconstruction was done. The idea was that people who knew the young woman would recognize her. In 2015, a man and a woman named Ellen and Donald Criswell came forward, claiming that they recognized the young woman. They went onto a website and found the picture titled Palma County Jane Doe and thought it looked similar to their missing niece, Diana Criswell. It was especially the gap between her two top teeth that helped them recognize her. On February 11, 2015, Diana Lee Criswell's DNA was matched to the young woman's DNA. After 27 years, it was finally known who she was. Her family members gathered at the cemetery she was buried and replaced the Jane Doe 19 gravestone with the Anna Lee Griswell gravestone. Diana was born September 20, 1971 in Washington. After her parents divorced, she became estranged from her family and would often run away. When she was 16, she began a relationship with 36-year-old Bill Ross Knight and they moved to Tucson, Arizona a few months before her body would be found. Bull owned a 22 caliber pistol. Nine days before Diana was found, he was prosecuted for robbery. He passed away in 2005 due to liver complications while serving time in prison. Police believe it was he who had ended the life of 16-year-old Diana. Hugh Turner and his wife Joyce lived in Alberta, Canada. Each winter, they would spend their time in their house in Mesa, Arizona, however. Hugh was still very active at age 85. He loved playing golf and taking long walks. Hugh unfortunately showed early signs of dementia and some short-term memory loss. On the 24th of December 2010, he left his Mesa home at around noon. When he didn't return, his family got worried. There was a massive search involving local police, search and rescue teams, and even psychics, but no evidence of him was found for nearly a decade. On January 5, 2019, a hiker was near Red Mountain when he stumbled upon human remains. DNA tests were done and was confirmed the remains belonged to Hugh Turner. This is what Hugh's daughter Janice had to say. I don't think any of us had thought we were ever going to know what happened to our father, and I've kind of figured that as sad as it is, we just won the cold case missing persons lottery, and someone found him, and that in itself is a miracle. Hugh was found about 8 kilometers from the neighborhood he lived in. He would have had to cross a canal and walk up some steep terrain to get to where he was found. Foul play is not suspected. Rick Hazelton grew up in Glen Falls, New York. When he turned 23 years old in 1986, he decided to move to New York City to become a street performer. A lot of his family relationships were strained, and most of his childhood friends have started their own families or moved away. Once Rick made it to New York City, he never contacted his family and friends, and they got worried. The search for him led nowhere and eventually his family had declared him legally dead. Rick's childhood friend, Brian Pynchon, became a police officer, and he was determined to find out what happened to his friend. After he retired, he spent most of his time trying to find Rick. He later came in contact with a detective in Nashville who had a sketch of a man who he believed could be Rick Hazelton. It turned out that Rick did not die. He tried being a street performer for a few months, and it did not work out for him. 
Afterwards, he spent a couple of months in Miami. One day, he came across an ad that showed a cheap airplane ticket to Denver, Colorado. From there, he hitchhiked to Western Colorado, where he met the woman that would become his wife. The couple had two children together. In 2001, the family moved to Oregon to be closer to his wife's family. Rick believed that his friends and family did not care about him and never tried contacting them. He believed that until Brian finally came into contact with him thanks to the detective in Nashville. Only then did he realize how many people have spent years looking for him. Rick and Brian started sending letters to each other and in August of 2019, Rick saved up money to go back to Glen Falls. He spent Thanksgiving with his family and hanged out with his friends. If you love someone, never give up on them, is what Brian said after he was reunited with Rick. Paulette Jaster was born in 1954 in Detroit, Michigan. During the 1970s, she and her family moved to Davison, Michigan. Paulette was known as a bright, pretty girl and was well liked. She was named to the National Honor Society at age 17 and was a gifted athlete. In late August 1972, she began her studies at Central Michigan University. After the initial semester, she dropped out however. Her family started to notice that something wasn't quite right with her, but they weren't sure exactly what it could be. She broke up with her high school sweetheart, she quit her job and she started using marijuana. In June of 1977, Paulette told the Davison police that people were trying to kill her and use her mind. Very little was known about mental health in the 1970s and she was sent to the Ypsilanti State Hospital for evaluation and then treatment. Her sister believes that she might have had schizophrenia. Less than two months after Paulette entered the state hospital, she signed herself out. Since she was an adult of 23 years of age, she was able to do this. Two days after her birthday party in 1979, she left town without saying goodbye to anyone. She was seen carrying an army-style duffel bag. Social security records show that in 1980 she earned $319 while working at a Walgreens in Mesa, Arizona. In 1983, Paulette's mother Caroline Jaster received a tip that her daughter might be in Florida and that she was in trouble. Caroline found several people that saw Paulette in Florida, but unfortunately this lead led nowhere. Near Christmas of 1989, one of Paulette's sisters received a call that she believed was from Paulette, but a woman refused to stay on the line. In 1996, there was a Minnesota Jane Doe that seemed like a positive match for Paulette but this turned out to be a false lead. In 2005, Caroline passed away without knowing what happened to her daughter. In 2008, her husband Edwin followed his wife. In 2014, Paulette's family was contacted by Debbie Saunders from Webb's Loops who believed she had cracked the case. She believed that a victim of a 1980 hit and run was Paulette. Testing was done on the remains and it turns out she was right. They actually used the unique freckle pattern on Paulette's face to identify her. Paulette had been buried in Houston and known only as Jane Doe from 1980 through 2014. After the identification, her grave, previously marked with only a case number, was replaced with a plaque identifying her as Paulette with birth and death dates and the family held a memorial service there in October 2014. Twenty-one-year-old Riley Zickel studied music and chemistry at Lewis and Clark College in Portland. In 2016, during summer break, he climbed into his car and drove from Portland to Mount Jefferson. He planned to hike and camp there for one night and then returned to his car and drive to Seattle to meet a friend. Riley never made it to Seattle and the search for him started. 340 people put in 5,000 hours searching for him 
in the 350 acres of forested wilderness. Riley's friends and even his half-brother also joined in the search for him. On August 1st, a hiker came forward with a photo he took on the 29th of July. Riley's family and the police believed it could be Riley, especially since the tent he took with him looks similar to the one that can be seen in the photograph. A man came forward, however, proving that he was the man in the photo, and not at all Riley. The search for him lasted longer than normal, since he had the resources and know-how to survive for long. But in October 2016, his parents held a memorial service for him, when they believed it was unlikely that he would be found alive. We are coping, his mom said at the time. The truth of it is he was only 21, but it's kind of a beautiful story in the sense that he died doing something he loved so much more than anything in the world, and now he's literally part of the mountain. In 2019, climbers reported to the sheriff's office that they found what they believed were Riley Zickel's remains, and they were right. The area was very prone to rock slides, and wouldn't have been searched properly three years ago when Riley first disappeared. Riley's father also said that Riley's clothes and equipment blended into the background. His father also said, I was not able to learn to live with not knowing what happened. So knowing, as painful as it is, is better.